A deep dive into the Gospel of Luke, an overview of chapter 9, verses 10 through 62, Messiah's Authority. Finishing section 4, Jesus' Mission, Messiah's Message and Work. We shall look at Messiah's authority over the natural world, seen in his feeding of 5,000, being recognized by human beings, foretelling his demise, and calling for radical followers. Then his authority over the supernatural world, when he was transfigured, recognized by God, foretelling his demise a second time, and calling for radical followers. Messiah's authority over the natural world. Messiah feeds 5,000 men. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida, but the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Jesus had earlier sent out the apostles to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Many of those who had heard the apostles had followed them to this place. The kingdom of God, let us recall, is wherever and whenever the king reigns. And here was the promised king, the son of David. Jesus not only spoke his message, but he healed the sick, demonstrating the truth of his message. He would eventually declare about himself, The kingdom of God is in your midst. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside, and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. Now, in this rural area, farmers usually had excess food that they were willing to sell or to share with relatives. Middle Eastern societies then and now were usually hospitable towards travelers. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fishes. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there, probably not many women and almost no children. But he said to the disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down, though not on grass. Bread was abundant. Farmers usually grew ancient wheat or icorn for sale and barley for consumption. Fish were easily found from the nearby Lake Galilee, then dried to preserve. John informs us there was a boy here who had five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets full of broken pieces that were left over, or in English, baskets full. How do you explain Jesus' nature miracles, his turning of water into wine, and his causing of food to multiply? Discuss this amongst yourselves. And then, did Jesus violate any laws of nature, laws of physics? From whence came his authority to make these things happen? What did they do with the twelve baskets full of leftovers? And what about Jesus' share? Who fed him? Do you suppose they tithed their leftover food to Jesus? Jesus is recognized by men. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? Why do you suppose he asked this? Was he testing to find out whether the crowds yet concluded that he was the Messiah? They replied, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back. 
Now, John had recently been beheaded by King Agrippa. Could this be he alive again? Now, Elijah had never died. Rather, he had been taken up into heaven. And Malachi had predicted that Elijah would return before Messiah arrived. So this made good sense. Or the ancient prophets. Some of them had predicted a future resurrection of the dead. For example, Isaiah, Your dead will live, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is as the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. But what about you, he asked? Who do you men say I am? Speaking for the twelve, Peter answered, God's Messiah. Finally, they had understood. Then Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Why did Jesus pose this query? His disciples had to understand who he really is in order to be ready for the events that would follow. Why not tell anyone? If too many concluded that he was the Messiah, then at his crucifixion, they would have been sorely disappointed and would have defected. Well, why not tell everybody? Well, later they would do so. Now, to understand the following text, we should review briefly the titles given in the Hebrew Bible to a coming one. He was sometimes called Messiah, Mashiach, Christ or Christos, both of which translate the Anointed One. He was to be a son or descendant of King David and would himself be called David the King, David being a family name. Malachi called him the messenger of the covenant who was to come, the righteous one in Isaiah, and the servant of the Lord, in contrast with other servants who had failed. He was called the son of man in Daniel. For a list of 21 such titles with proof texts, go to the website. Then Jesus said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Why did he say the Son of Man and not the Messiah? Now, Son of Man was an Aramaic phrase, Bar Enosh, which simply translates human being. Well, what was special about this human being? For this, we consult Daniel chapter 7. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one as a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, a title for God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, what human being comes riding on clouds? And this human being was to become a global king. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, Messiah is never said to suffer nor is the Son of Man said to suffer. So how can Jesus, or Luke, say that the Son of Man must suffer, or say that the Messiah Christ must suffer? Rather, it was the Righteous One, the Lord's Servant, who had to suffer. By simple logic, if A equals C and B equals C, then A equals B. Then Jesus calls for radical discipleship. He said to them all, Whoever want to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever want to save their life will lose it, but whoever lose their life for me will save it. The cross here refers in particular to the cross beam, which condemned criminals were required to carry in public before being hanged on the vertical pole which was left in place. What does it mean to deny? According to the Greek lexicon, it is to disclaim association with a person, 
to deny, repudiate, or disown someone else. Thus, to deny yourself is the opposite of denying Christ. So, we ourselves, we start each day affirming Jesus as Lord, willing to lose anything in order to gain everything. The book of Hebrews reminded us, others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Yes, we suffer loss of goods, of reputation, of health if necessary, and even our life in order to enjoy more glory when Jesus shall return and raise us to life, even as he has risen to life. Now let's turn to Messiah's authority over the supernatural world. Jesus is transfigured. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. Now, this was atop Mount Hermon which was believed to be a dwelling place of gods and spirits, at the foot of which was the Grotto of Pan, also called the Gates of Hell. Discuss amongst yourselves, how did they know that these men were Elijah and Moses? Do you suppose Jesus told them so afterwards? And what were these two prophets informing Jesus about? They had brought to him a message about something from heaven. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Not his death, but his departure. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Now, when and how did Jesus later depart? We shall see shortly. Why was Jesus' departure an important subject for Messiah to understand? Well, this departure was not clearly revealed in the Hebrew Bible. Then recall what Daniel had said about the Son of Man, that he would arrive and receive an everlasting kingdom. Well, when would that happen? How will Jesus connect his identity as the Son of Man with a departure instead of receiving an everlasting kingdom. Let us try to understand it in this fashion. First, we see Moses and Elijah discussing Jesus' departure with him. Secondly, the Lord's servant must suffer, be crucified and risen. Following which, after some 40 days then, would occur Jesus' departure, going up into the clouds, eventually to be followed by his return as Son of Man, coming in clouds to receive his kingdom. Thus, Jesus learned that he must depart before he become king. Then Jesus is recognized by God. As the men were leaving, a cloud appeared and covered them, and the apostles were afraid as they entered the cloud, or as the cloud covered them. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. Now there were three occasions on which God spoke audibly to Jesus in public. First at his baptism when the voice said to him, You are my beloved son. Now, at his transfiguration, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And next week he will say, I will glorify my name again. So then, Jesus said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Well, Daniel had not told us about that part. So they did not understand what this meant. Now, into the hands is a figure of speech meaning to 
be put under the power of someone else. Why was this so hard to understand? Well, it was not a detail of their eschatology. So Jesus again talks about radical discipleship. Who is this man driving a vehicle, looking backwards while consulting his mobile phone? As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, his departure, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. This is a transition point in the Gospel of Luke. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, Jesus replied, Well, thank you, but foxes have dens and birds have nests, but I, the Son of Man, have no place where to lay my head. I cannot offer you lodging. So Jesus' departure was to be taken up to heaven. See Acts chapter 1. Until when? Jesus will arrive back from heaven to become king of the whole world, an event which has not yet occurred, and reason for which Talmudic Jews reject Jesus as Messiah. And what does it mean to follow him? This means to learn from him, to obey his instructions, to imitate his manner of life, and even to die young unjustly, if required. When Jesus say he had no place to lay his head, John later reported, Jesus said, It is finished. Then he bowed, or lay his head, and gave up his spirit. Radical discipleship. Jesus said to another man, Follow me. But this man replied, Well, sir, uh, yes, but first let me go and bury my father. Well, his father was still very much alive. So Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their dead, or let the dead care for themselves. But you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, this text was explained to me by African brothers some years ago in the shade of a tree. To bury one's parents, this remains a filial duty. One who did not care for his aging parents would be shamed by his community. He could never have a testimony. And to go and proclaim? This, then, must be an important task, worth risking an inheritance and even one's reputation. So they got the application right with a different explanation from mine. Still another one said to Jesus, I will follow you, sir, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What will family members say to dissuade you from risking your health and wealth to go carry the gospel to an unreached people group somewhere else? And what would be a modern trope that means to put a hand to the plow and look back? And you, have you made a vow to the Lord that you have not yet fulfilled? Could you give a year or two serving a Christian ministry before too late? So what did you discover today? What truth from this passage could you affirm? What promise could you claim? And what commands could you obey? Your assignment for next time is to read Luke chapter 10 through chapter 11, verse 13. Then visit the website for links to other materials. And whilst reading, compile your insights, queries, and observations to share with others.